Hey there, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Alchemiculture Podcast. I'm your host, Phoenix Aurelius, and today I am joined by a dear friend of mine named Ash Ritter. Ash Ritter is the uh, owner and proprietor, I suppose you could say, of Black Sage Botanicals. I'm a big fan of the treats that she makes, uh, which she has traditionally had some subscription packages for. We met at the Good Medicine Confluence in 2023. I remember when she walked through the door, I didn't know her from Adam, but I looked at her and I was just like, yo, what's up? And I ran up and I gave her a hug and she was like, hey, Phoenix, <laughs> that's cool. And I was like, yeah, what's your name? <laughs> and that's actually how we met. It was like a deep kindred um, association just from the moment I saw her. And uh, even though we only had like three or four days together, we got really close and able to jive on a good number of levels. So I am very pleased to present to you the one, the only Ash Ritter. Ash, how are you doing today? Hello. Um, thank you so much, Phoenix. I'm great. I'm happy good. to be here. And it's always a delight to be in kindred uh gnome gnome relations <laughs> yeah totally yeah i've got my <laughs> tunic and even my hat going yes. on so. <laughs> so ash you know a lot of people know you for a lot of different things like you're you're kind of a person that's a bit like myself where you know people might know you for for one thing but you have like a whole range of interests and talents um, some of the things that folks know you best for are your work with Poison Path, your work with mycology, your work with psychedelia, your work with herbalism, your work with mycology. What am I leaving out? <laughs> Gosh, I mean, I think at the heart of it, it's one of those things where when we live in a reality or in realities where everything is alive and connected, it's like, how dare we compartmentalize ourselves so there's always more to say. <laughs> There's always more to say in that regard. But but yes, um, I write, I teach, I create. I'm an apothecarist. I'm a practicing herbalist. Um, but my favorite thing is I'm just a nerd um, and utilizing fungi and plants to give me a lens through which I can enjoy history because as it's been said, half of the story has never been told. And I think that when we find these interesting lenses like plants and mushrooms to look through, um, and petroglyphs is another, archaeology is another one, right? Um, all of these patterns start to reveal through um, and beyond just the written word alone. So I don't know, there's a million things I'm up to, but okay, yeah, so on the umbrella of that. Yeah, we <laughs> We've covered a, a decent amount of, of things that people can chew, I guess. Yes. So, you know, one of the things that you had taught recently was a class on, quote unquote, the forbidden fruits. And this was offered in November and people who are interested can still get access to these classes. Maybe you could go into a little bit of detail about um, what that class kind of was and, and give us a little sample, a little taste of some of the things that you were talking about and presenting on. Oh, gosh. So the Forbidden Fruit series is honestly kind of a continuation of the conversations I've presented around um, flying ointments, Solanaceae plants, a continuation on my love of Amanita muscaria, a continuation on ergot, um, all of these things that honestly are pointing towards by who and what authority have these symbolic iconic fruits, be they pomegranate, be they apple, be they fungi of many kinds, by who and what authority have they been made forbidden? And what is the story behind that? And then beginning to tell that story without being like, here's this conspiracy and that conspiracy, but <laughs> literally breaking down what is the etymology, what is the form and function of something like an apple, what plant family is it in, what is the significance of the number five that we see when we cut an apple in half and <laughs> all of these things. So through the, the exploration of the quote unquote medicine um, and energy and history of how we've engaged with these plants and mushrooms, it kind of points us towards this deeper story of why did they become forbidden and why would something like the Roman Catholic Church not <laughs> not not uplift these these fruits you know so um totally it's a fascinating 
long meandering spiraling <laughs> <laughs> story yeah absolutely as, as all good things are all good stories are you know, you mentioned something, and this is something that you have a lot of experience with and and have written about and talked about quite a bit is Amnita muscaria mushroom. Yeah. Uh, Amnita is, of course, one of my favorite to encounter in the wild. There's a deep <laughs> connection and a symbiosis between me and the earth when I can ground into certain familiar friends that I find in multiple different ecosystems. And Amanita is one of those things that, especially during my time in the Pacific Northwest, was mm -hmm. extraordinarily prominent for me. And also here in the Uinta Mountains, uh, as a young kid, so, mm -hmm. you know, Uintas just are the only east-west running mountain range inside of the continental U.S., and huh. they're nestled inside of the Rockies, and they're, uh, you know, on the border between Utah and Wyoming, and a uh, very high elevation, you know, we get like uh, some 14ers and things like that up there. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, I've encountered them quite a bit. Now, my experiences with Amanita have absolutely been frightening beyond all reason. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, not knowing doses or other things, being able to take them and waking up from the most insane nausea that I've ever had and feeling mm. like I'm in a dream without having any context for that um, was frightening. With, with Looking back, had was I older? Was I, you know, more experienced in the lore? Was the information not so repressed? I mean, this was in the very, very early days, even where Arrowhead was brand new. So yeah. there wasn't a whole lot of information about these, these types of things. Um, but it's caused me to have a bit of a trauma around wanting to go through and continually to work with with this medicine. Although, as I understand it, it's been pivotal to Siberian shamanism for you know hundreds, if not thousands of years. So I'm interested to just kind of get your own stance, your own take, some of your own experiences and to, um, yeah, just inform me better about this, the, yeah, this I'm... fungi ally. <laughs> I mean, of course, it's like I could say so, so, so many things and do say so many things and will continue <laughs> to say so many things about this mushroom because of that, that um, beautiful seeming polarity that it presents where it's so absolutely loved and it's so absolutely feared. And those are the things oftentimes I gravitate towards because it sparks this deep sense of curiosity. So with Amanita muscaria, um, I started with the folklore. Um, I started, I'm like, why is it on the greeting cards? What's the connection to the gnomes? Who are the gnomes anyhow? Um, and, <laughs> you know, and this was before there was sort of the trending memeology of Santa as a mushroom shaman and all of that. Right. All that yada, yada, yada. Um, but yeah, long, long story short, I dove in first through the lens of folklore and sign and symbol and mythology so-called mythology, um, <laughs> which right. I, th I think mythology is literally just um, like in Spanish, it's called cosmovision, right? It's, yeah. it's not, it's not pretend. <laughs> it's not pretend on, on the other hand, it's enchanted and yeah. enchantment um, is a real plane in my experience, in my opinion, enchantment is a real plane that we all can enter into through the door, right? What, who are the Druids anyhow? What is the Oak like through the door? <laughs> um, Absolutely. It's one of those mushrooms that, um, yeah, has that deep seated polarity story going on. So as I started to dive into the folklore, I started going, of course, I started looking in the sort of Hyperborean North and, Siberia and going down that through Finland down 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 and I started to recognize that this beautiful mushroom has a significance a place and importance across the planet across the entire planet and we often associate it with um, the global north and uh, Siberia in particular because that's what the academia guys write about but they're well, not that's writing. where it was kind of first <laughs> talked about in the yeah. like late 19th and early 20th century right yep absolutely i mean and 
interestingly enough, I Austin, um, the interesting CIA funded fellow who we know of <laughs> for going down to Huautla de Jimenez and uh, eating psilocybe mushrooms with Maria Sabina and then putting her on blast by way of Life magazine. Right. Life magazine. But, um, he wrote a book called Soma, and it's a super, super fascinating book where he's presenting this argument that Soma, um, this elixir or this nectar of immortality that's written about in the Rig Veda in India was Amanita muscaria. So a lot of the kind of academia circles just sort of regurgitate that story over and over and over and over. Right. And I think it's a worthy exploration. And like, what about these, all of these different um, names for this mushroom and uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, associates with this mushroom um, deities. That's the word I'm looking for. These deities. Kind of, associates yeah. is good though. <laughs> associates. <laughs> <laughs> these, 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 these otherworldly associates of these mushrooms that um, even just looking at the name, we see, you know, one legged lightning bolt, um, spotty warded, um, um, red speckled, you know, all over through the Celtic world, through the Mesoamerican world, we see the importance of this mushroom. So then I started to go in further and I got the clear message and it said, it's time that you ingest this mushroom. This is going to connect you to your ancestors. And so much of my work as an ethnobotanist, ethnomycologist, um, is founded upon me being a psychonaut, um, not for medicalized healing as much as learning, exploring, being curious, um, traveling, you know? So, right, yeah. so, so I've always had at the core of that, um, I'm not trying to romanticize something that I'm not like, let me go deep into the wellspring of my own DNA and eat the, eat the things of my people and Amanita muscaria presented itself this is one and I wouldn't talk about it out loud in my research for years because of the stigma and I was like as soon as I talk about this people are going to put on that tinfoil hat on their old buddy ash and they're going to say you're going to kill people you're going to poison people and the joke is like look at any pharmaceutical commercial and I'm like why are you not saying you're going to kill people you're going to poison people on those you know <laughs> or or if the things seriously do, though or the things we do for food, like if we want to eat acorns, we leach out the tannins, right? Like, so precisely, there are preparation methods to render this mushroom um, more friendly to our bodies. <laughs> and the interesting thing about it is different preparation methods coax out different chemistry different the different chemistry does all kinds of different things yeah um, that's a good point so oh we could keep going but yeah many things i could say <laughs> well, <laughs> we could keep going. Let's, let's maybe dive into it because i i know that this is a topic of of interest like a lot of people do, don't know this about me but when i first started my alchemical and spagyric pathway in 2000 i guess it was like late 2003 early 2004 around the same time, about 20 years ago, I guess. Um, I, in order to be able to fund, I had just graduated high school and I, in order to be able to fund my work with plants, I had to figure out how to be able to create a sustainable source of income that would allow me to be able to do this. And at that time, for the most part, it was kind of like what people are now calling a side hustle. But um, at that time, I was really big into entheogens and I had a business called Diviner's Rights Alchemical Mastery and Diviner's Rights Natural My and Lifestyle. And it was spelled Diviner's R-I-G-H-T-S, like it is the right of all individuals to be able to find and express that aspect of the divine within them. And so entheogens fit a huge role in that. And so a lot of the local smoke shops and tattoo parlors and stuff like that knew me as the legal drug dealer because I was bringing substances like salvia divinorum and amanita muscaria and kratom and, um, you know, canna and lots of other different types of things, betel nut, to their place and being like, 
you know, these are substances that can be utilized responsibly and creating these beautiful write-ups about them so that they could be used shamanically. Of course, they also got abused and eventually that led to salvia divinorum being illegalized here and in many other places across the nation and things like that. But Amanita was always one of those ones where people were like, oh, I'm going to take legal shrooms and trip. And it's like, well, I advise some caution here. And in those days, there, like you were talking about, there wasn't a whole lot of chemistry around how to prepare them. We knew that there's muscimol inside of them. And we knew that muscarine was also inside of them and that those can interact very poorly with some monoamine neurotransmitters that are very important to our health. But the methods of preparation were like, yeah, so I, I took these and I like steamed them and tore off the skin and then just like consumed the skin and I vomited for hours. And like, that was the kind of extent of research that a person could be able to do fast forward now 20 years and there's a whole lot more because of folks like yourself who, are, who have been willing to go down this path collect stories collect methods of preparation look at it from a phytochemical and biochemical per, or and i guess mycochemical perspective um mm -hmm. so yeah let's let's talk about that like what types of preparations uh have you kind of worked with and and how does that draw out a different intelligence from the plant that can then kind of channel its way through through the individual. Oh my gosh. So I'm a big experimenter. And if you saw this side of my house, you'd see probably like yourself, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of bottles. So I love doing five different more plus preparation styles of one plant or one mushroom and wow. exploring like what is the personality like when the context changes, when the environment, the terrain, <laughs> when the terrain of the medicine is presented in such a way, how does that inform the spirit of that plant or that mushroom to shine through? So, you know, of course, first of all, I wanted to really get to know this mushroom one on one. So I started experimenting with tea, first of all. And um, so that would be primarily a slow and low decoction of the caps. Um, now what's interesting, and this is a whole other rabbit hole is depending on where it's grown, they're going to, and this is true for anything, right? They're going to express their chemistry differently. Now, what we're dealing with too, is this is a mycorrhizal mushroom, meaning that it lives in relationship with trees. So yeah. the thing that I see a lot with people who talk about Amanita muscaria preparation is they're talking about it with this sort of like, um, allopathic bravado like I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this mushroom and I'm like actually when we engage with this mushroom we are engaging with the intelligence of the entire forest and the chemistry expressed through that mushroom is informed by what it's growing with right so decoction I'd start with that um, slow and low. So Amanita muscaria is a mushroom that through the process of heat the decarboxylation happens where the primary chemistry that people talk about, ibotenic acid, mm -hmm. turns into muscimol. So ibotenic acid is a pro-drug to muscimol. Um, if someone were to chomp Amanita muscaria raw, that would be such a different sensation and feeling and different <laughs> manifestations um, than a like cooked, if you will, decarboxylated preparation. And Interestingly enough, like both have medicinal value and spiritual value, in my opinion, but one is way more uncomfortable in the body than the other. Well, yeah. And for me, like the, my <laughs> method was like, basically make a quick tea out of it, you know, as like an infusion of a dried cap mm -hmm. and then straining out the biomass, of course, and, and then drinking that. I can only imagine that what I was getting was a large amount of hypotonic acid which was harsh in my body i mean among the most intense gastric discomfort that i have ever experienced in my life and i felt like i was dying oh and then i fell asleep and woke up and still felt awful didn't care so much though because i felt like i was in a dream yes you know? yes i mean and that's the thing and that's the to me the beauty of these paradox plants and paradox mushrooms it's like hypotonic acid is like a crazy central nervous system stimulant, you know, 
Um, and then muscarine also is cholinergic. So yeah. we have that side of the fence. But then once you through decarb, and there's many ways to decarb, right? But once you through decarb, uh, transform, alchemize into musc muscamol, um, you have a GABAergic compound. So it's this, all of a sudden, it's this living in the dream compound. Euphoria, it's Euphoria, so, almost. Euphoria, and it's like, closing down all the freaking noise um from all the signal inputs that we get so there's a lot of really interesting places where i like to play with that um presentation so anyway de decoction is simple and easy um i've experimented with different tincture methods um i've experimented with fermentation um which is also really interesting and one of the ones that I don't talk about too often, but is super primary to my personal exploration is um, flying ointments. So topical applications in higher doses um, on the mucous membranes of the body. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Yep. A lot of people write in and ask us where we source our herbs. Well, some of them I grow or wild harvest myself, others I pay to do the same thing for me. I scour high quality Asian herb suppliers, I've even developed relationships with really unique purveyors and even some growers over the years. But one place that we've relied upon for almost 20 years now is Mountain Rose Herbs. This company sets a standard for green companies as they're the first zero waste company in Oregon. Their whole facility runs off of renewable energy, their fleet vehicles run on biodiesel, they have sustainable packaging, they're beyond fair trade, they support small farms all over the world, and they're just an all-around badass company. We have a long-standing relationship with them and we know that we can trust the quality of all the herbs, spices, teas, oils, body butters, and other health goods that they have in stock. Everything they have is certified organic, fair trade, and or wild harvested, and they have really strict COAs, or Certificates of Analysis. Even though we have a lot of herbal suppliers, they remain one of our main go-to shops when we're looking for high-quality herbal starting materials. We highly recommend checking them out, stocking up on some herbs, teas, or even body care supplies. And of course, we're an affiliate of Mountain Rose Herbs, so every purchase you make when you use our affiliate link directs a portion of your purchase to support and fund this podcast and support our other research here at the Phoenix Aurelius Research Academy. To get our link, just head to phoenixaurelius.org slash thealchema-culture-podcast. Scroll down to the link on the Mountain Rose Herbs icon, and that will direct you to their site. As always, thank you so much for supporting our work by using our affiliate links each time you choose to shop with them. Now, that that is really fascinating. Let's talk about tinctures for a second, if you don't mind, because that's, you know, <laughs> now, you're, now you're talking fees language here. But um, with... Uh, tincturing, I've noticed that ethanol, or at least high percentage ethanol, typically like 95% to 100% ethanol, produces a really moderate, moderate effect. Uh, I mean, you would have to drink so much of the resulting tincture before you could start to have very significant effects, psychedelic effects at any rate, so, you know, that um, you would probably be much more drunk off of the alcohol content than you would feeling the psychedelics and that's true for a lot of different tinctures especially at that high high dose so when you've experimented with tinctures have you found something similar to myself that they are psychotropic in that they can help to like tonify various aspects of the body without producing a full-on psychedelic experience or like what what's your own experience with the with that type of extraction well like the way that I've been working the tincture that has felt best for me is I'll do a really strong decoction uh -huh. and then I do my own little fermentation thing with the decoction. And then I essentially create like a triple extract tincture um, as a way to preserve that decoction. Oh, okay. So my sense around tincturing is more a way to preserve the water soluble stuff yeah. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. You know what I mean? And that to me creates a really, really interesting um, offering that at low doses can be really functional, especially for people that get like wildly sensory <laughs> overwhelm, which is a lot of us in this day and age, yeah. <laughs> you know, like um, amazing for sensory overwhelm and lower doses. And then all of a sudden it can be this really interesting um, exploration and discussion around the pain body. Um, so oh. we're talking about physical pain but also I feel like we're talking about like um, the wiring of what makes us believe pain or go into PTSD stuff where we experience pain from something that maybe doesn't need to be a pain trigger anymore. Um, so there's really interesting things at, at moderate doses as far as how do we relate to this notion of the pain body do we want to reprogram or reshuffle our relationship with the pain body and then of course at higher doses so-called hypnotic disassociative but like you said it's just living in the dream you know <laughs> um, and living in the dream can be a really useful way to get data right <laughs> yeah, absolutely it can so, but that's the thing is a lot of people who are being sold some random ass Amanita muscaria gummies in a head shop, like, um, we don't know if that's decarbed or not. They're expecting something like psilocybe where they're like, is the right. wall, wavy? is the wall wavy? <laughs> well, <laughs> it might not be wavy. You know, there are interesting visual stuff, things that can happen for sure, but it's different. Um, yeah. everything's different. So so yeah, the tincture, what I've found is that the alcohol, the more alcohol soluble compounds, I like more for topical liniment use for nerve pain. Yeah, you know? that's, that's pretty cool. That's yeah. And now that's something that I have not really even branched too much into is using liniment, using a lot of the spagyric tinctures that I make, especially for liniments. What I have experienced is that um, the radical ve vegetable menstruum is what it's called within the alchemical tradition, or what we would now call ethyl acetate primarily from a chemical perspective, um, produces a very interesting extraction of, uh, amanita that can border on if, if you distill out all of the ethyl acetate and don't redissolve it in any sort of menstruum, you can take that pitch and it becomes like an extract that can be dissolved into a lot of different types of, of oil substrates and other things that can be then used topically that way, or it can be ingested directly, but just as long as you've purged it well of the ethyl acetate. I mean, in small doses, ethyl acetate isn't uh, harmful to be ingested. It's, in fact, it's in a lot of endogenous ferments, especially aerobic ferments, as you know. So, um, but in, in small doses, right. And properly diluted. So, but with that being said, um, that, that really is about the extent of where my experience has, has played with it is infusion. Of course, I've read a lot about decoction, uh, of the mushroom and most of the beneficial experiences that I have read of people's preparations that actually do originate with, with a decoction, like you said, low and slow, um, I've also seen, you know, the, I'm, I'm interested, do you know what the decarboxylation temperature actually is for, for ebotenic acid? If my memory serves me, it's around 200 Fahrenheit. Oh, 200, okay. So it's about the boiling temp of water then like 212 Fahrenheit is boiling, right? So it seems mm -hmm. like a good a good match for that particular thing. And that makes sense. I mean, when we take a look at, at the documented literature of Siberian shamans, quote unquote, using this, we see a wide range of different historical uses through different periods and different areas of Siberia are not all East. Siberia is enormous. And so like one area of Siberia here and another area here, it's all just lumped into Siberia, but they have totally different cultures, totally different beliefs, totally different cosmologies. And so, but one of the things that I always found to be really fascinating in some of that early literature from the early 20th century in particular, was that they would say that they would boil the mushroom for a time, 
not they never said what time but boil the mushroom for a time then to drink the broth of that mushroom and then they would recycle their urine drinking their urine multiple times up to seven to ten times over a period of like hours even days and it continues to kind of flush through the system and create different levels of experience i've never played with that myself has that been anything that you've ever worked with and i'm sorry to put you on the spot of like are you oh. drinking urine but you hey, know you could, you could i'm open to talking about pretty much anything my friend um Good. I, I haven't i haven't ingested my own be mushroomed urine but i wouldn't be, <laughs> I, like I, that wouldn't term. Be, <laughs> I wouldn't be afraid of it what and then this is me being now maybe way too transparent it's like what i'm interested in is for my future sweetheart wherever he may be is like is like, you know, when we talk about, <laughs> I'm just going to say, when we talk about like Amrita, when we talk about Soma, when we talk about yeah. neck, like thinking also about female ejaculatory fluids. Totally. And if I, if I, or me and a sweetheart were to ingest, say, for example, Amanita muscaria decoction, and then through a process of kindred connection in that way, like, what would happen <laughs> what would happen with different fluids i think could be really interesting so one day uh, and we'll yeah. report my findings <laughs> at some point that's awesome this is where the erotic and psychedelia really interlap right there but that right. is a really really fantastic idea and a really fantastic concept um yep. something <laughs> that does deserve more merit as taboo within our present society and you know the cool thing about where we're at in modern ages everything is so wacky hardly anything is taboo these days <laughs> you know or, oh lord yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but yeah that is that's really fascinating well you know unless unless there's anything else that you want to chat about about amnita i feel like we could probably start talking about other other different substances other different topics even Sure. I mean, and it all connects because right, even, you know, and again, I guess I'll I'll reiterate that thinking about this, this beautiful mushroom as a sort of this like little standout beacon, um, collecting, collecting solar data um, for the land and then transmitting that through the roots into the trees and all this, I find that a more potent spiritual preparation for myself is including something like a tiny little pinch of oak bark or a little pine mm. needles here and there or a little whoop of usnia or a little boop of birch leaf um and the way that we can synergize you know and this is the thing about the sort of pharmaceutical model that's being overlaid onto psychedelics in general where it's right. like this is the this is the stack you have to do exactly this stack and it's cookie cutter for everybody and to me not only is that boring but it's so kind of um lifeless <laughs> it really is yeah <laughs> so so that even could segue into something like you know, with this conversation about flying ointments, which is these, you know, topical preparations of all different kinds of plants and fungi. I think too, you know, when we think about something like Amanita muscaria or dare I say ergot, it's, you know, I found in some of these texts, older texts written by priests. So it's, yeah, you know, but, <laughs> but uh, when they're listing the witch's ointments, they'll say like there's ash included. And when I first read that, I thought, oh, how fascinating. Is it like burnt plant material to alkalize maybe like DMT containing stuff or what is the ash? And of course I'm ash. So I, and I love ash. So I was like, what is the ash? What is the ash? And, and then I found a suggestion that it was actually ergot. It wasn't burnt plant material. It was rye smut. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Um, which, which is you know, black and can look kind of like ash. You're right. And then I started thinking, well, what about, you know, the addition of fungi of many different kinds in these topical preparations? And what would happen if I included just for fun, some burnt red skin of the Amanita muscaria 
in a topical preparation, would that be psychoactive as opposed to just numbing nerve pain? And um, so, yeah, there's so many fun segues to think about, you know, when we read in the textbooks, Ash, so many people would just see that and they'll make a meme about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, but let's, let's think about this, you know, and <laughs> let's dig deeper and let's get curious. And then ultimately, I love being a researcher. You're a researcher, you know what I mean? But I also love being an experimenter. And I'm like, if I don't try it in my body, my body being the best scientist ever, all of our bodies, right? Yes. If you want to like trust the science, I'm like, trust your body. That, that, that's ama an amazing vessel. <laughs> it's so true, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, we could segue however you want to. <laughs> well, you know, th there is something that I would I want to kind of unpack. You know, you had talked mm -hmm. about amnita actually growing as just the fruiting body of a larger mycelial network, connecting it with trees. Some yeah. of the networks that are connected are very, very vast um, and connect to multiple different trees and actually serve as, you know, the oxygen and water and nutrient administrators basically or or network distributors i guess would be the better term to large bodies of the forest so when we're consuming the fruiting body of this inside of its epigenetics are actually a history of the entire forest network the entire boreal network that it is found in and to not discredit that but to really look at it you know this is why when you source things that are say, you know, Amnita commonly gets uh, commercially sourced from say like Latvia and various places in e Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. We have no connection to those forests. Most of us have never been to Latvia. Most of us have no idea what the, that connection is, what the temperature, the humidity, the sunlight, the nutrients, the health of the forest even is, or how that forest is looked at, mm -hmm. especially, you know, it, is it heavily forested? Are the trees in pain? Are the trees themselves hurting for sunlight or adapting to ecological changes or under a state of distress? And so because we're so disconnected from that environment, taking in those things, it's dawning on me now that like, oh, wow, a huge portion of the experience is actually largely dependent upon the materials bioregion itself. That's so, right. That's it. I mean, and for all of your listeners, you know, who are into terrain theory, I'm like, think about it not just as your individual body, but think about it, yeah, as this entire, the entire earth, you know, informs. It, it's all, it's all, this, it's yes. all connected, right? <laughs> yeah, the, absolutely. And even thinking too about fungi are our ancestors, if, if you will. Fungi are yeah. our ancestors. In but my we opinion. share so much DNA with fungi, per, arguably more than we do with many members of the animal kingdom, that it stands to reason that there is a connection there, whether they are technically our ancestors, like, you know, they travel through outer space to get to us, Terrence McKenna style. Here we or, go. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the hypersphere. The hypersphere. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's so yeah, I'm right there with you. And that's the thing too, is as as much as it's so in this day and age, it's so easy for us to click a button and say, ah yes, I want the most exotic, exciting, newest to me, psychedelic, or whatever, whatever it may be. Well, there's a deep curiosity and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that I think at the same time what would it feel like to engage with the intelligence of the land we live on or engage with the intelligence of the land our our human lineage is from where my ancestors lived and all of those things and even thinking too about this connection with fungi in general and and um, voltage and lightning yeah. Which is something I feel like not a lot of people talk about that in the health and well. I know there's that old uh, like body electric book and all of this, and there's Jerry Tennant talking about voltage, but thinking about how fungi growth is enhanced by lightning. And so many of these deities 
that are in association with Muscaria in some way or another are lightning deities. Yeah. So I love thinking about too, like you said, where you live in these high altitudes. I'm like, how does that data set inform the expression of that landscape and then that mushroom, right? So yeah, there are so many elements that we engage with when we take medicine. And I could say like, yes, this is a Hawthorne tincture right here. But <laughs> really, you know, everything is everything is a uh, community. Yeah. You know, it's like what endophytes were living in the roots, what birds were landing on top, were they nibbling the berries or not? How did the stress of those nibbles create more uh, uh, aromatic compounds, you know, or whatever, whatever. Yeah, so exactly. it's fun. That is well, and it's so fun to, you know, actually engage. That's, that's actually my key point of wild harvesting is being able to engage with various levels of ecosystem knowledge. For me, um, having a very strong background in, you know, I, I don't really like to use the term druidry because, you know, you have like the OBOD and you have, you know, all of these different uh, 19th century occult revival style, styles of druidry. I, I tend to follow a much more eclectic and personalized type of path where it's, for me, it's about reading the source material and then drawing inspiration from it and enlivening that information that lives within me from these ancestral, the ancestral knowledge that's within me. But if I had to say one, one particular path, it's kind of Irish Druid inspired. So with that being said, you know, for me, it's going a, around to an ecosystem, connecting in with the water, connecting in with the air, connecting in with the land in those places and being able to honor the nature spirits and all of the spirits of the ecosystem that are there, asking for their permission, teaching them, you know, asking them for, for them rather to teach me about what constitutes their understanding of health, what constitutes their understanding of well-being and of history, and then me teaching them what my perspective is and sharing and growing before performing a type of harvesting and you know here in utah where i'm still at there's a canyon that i've been harvesting from i oftentimes just refer to it as my personal medicine cabinet but it's also known as taylor canyon in Kristen spring area and um i have been wild harvesting there for about 20 years now and i remember before i ever harvested anything my connection with that area told me that I had to steward that area. And so that took me taking wild roses from high up on the mountain cliffs that were growing out of very precarious rocks near the source of the spring and taking them down little cuttings <laughs> and taking them down to lower elevations and planting them. That now little plant is enormous. And so many people get rose hips from that, that one little plant. And it wasn't until like two or three years of stewarding the watercress and taking it again from the higher streams and putting it down to lower, more accessible elevations and um, being able to spread a lot of the cacti that were there and being able to, you know, just basically create an ecological system that was suitable and sustainable for the animal life long before it was ever suitable to be harvested from yeah. that, you know, that, that was, that still is deep in my DNA, like a huge part of my epigenetic expression. And also my evolution as an herbalist actually came from those plants that I was able to find there and what I was able to steward and how I was able to find the key species that give way to yet other species. Like if I found that that rose eventually created shaded areas that would allow for other different species to grow. And it wasn't until two or three years after that rose grew that then wherever they came from, wild yarrow seeds started to spread and they started to grow in the, the sunny areas around the, the rose. Whereas in the shaded areas, we started to get, you know, all sorts of different types of, of plant life actually. And this last year, I was just seeing enormous amounts, but you know, we started to see that burdock would grow back in these areas and other different types of things, creating this huge multi-layered network of consciousness, of plant consciousness. It was 
it's yeah. yeah that that has definitely always spoken i forgot where i was even going with that because i started getting caught away you know caught up in the memories and carried away but yeah i mean sure. i'm excited with you <laughs> <laughs> i'm excited with you because to me i'm like that's the way to do it and it, you know in the last um little chunk of years as herbalism is now trending and all these things you know there's been these movements for people who are against wild crafting and in yeah. many in many respects i understand why because it's a going in with a a a a grabby kind of more corporate a make off of a at uh, a, a approach as opposed to this like you're saying this relational stewardship nature or a relational stewardship approach where you know something i tell my students a lot is before you harvest anything, observe for a year and see what animals visit it, what, like you're saying, what plants grow in relationship with this other plant or, or what fungi grows in relationship with this plant. Um, how does its expression change over the year? When does its tastes change? And all of these things tell us how to be in right relationship with that plant. And in my opinion, um, certain plants and fungi thrive and I've seen it <laughs> thrive off of being in relationship with humans. So the approach then becomes how do we, how does our uh, practice of creating cool elixirs and compounds um, benefit and maybe even enhance the wild environment that we're a part of because we're wild too. And I think a lot of people forget that. And when they forget they go out and they just harvest a bunch of shit with no reverence right but when we recognize our wild my feeling is when we recognize our wildness and that we're constantly in relationship with fungi in our guts we're constantly in relationship with bacteria on our eyelashes we're constantly yeah. in relationship with all these things so we want there to be a harmoniousness there so if we look at it and approach it here then we can do that out there um so yeah i'm right yeah. there with you <laughs> that is, yeah, that is such an important thing. And yeah, as it pertains, yeah, that's actually something that um, I can see the value in a lot of teachers being like, don't go and wild harvest things because, you know, you can get it sustainably, you know, crafted or, or grown, cultivated in other places, and then it doesn't diminish the population. But really, before you say that, the first thing has to really be address your own sense of exploitation right there it how is. have you been <laughs> exploited how did yeah. you not like that don't do that to others then right yeah. and that extends to <laughs> like just about everything because yeah if you find a resource and you feel that that resource can be exploited for monetary gain that's a whole wrong energy to enter into just about anything with that leads to slavery that you know on a human level that leads to just all the icky shit about humanity but when we deal with authentic connections with individuals, you know, it's like, it's like this right here. Okay. Uh, I'm not exploiting you by having a conversation with you. We are yeah. having this co-communication, you know, there is a, a, recip a reciprocity to it. And we can have that with the vast majority of nature, but it takes to my understanding and in my, my system, really listening deeply and not through our ears, but kind of through the heart and through the concept of what is necessary for the life expression of this plant or of this organism, because it can be an animal, it can be a fungi, it can be anything. What is necessary for its expression? And how can I, through my relationship with it, benefit that expression and how can its expression help benefit me? That becomes, you know, it's like that aspect because you know we say uh uh oh jesus what's the term um where altruism where mm -hmm. altruism is dead you know altruism doesn't really exist in in nature either like when you're just going out and saying hey altruistically i want to help you what are you getting out of it even if you're drawing experience right mm -hmm. it's, yep there's there's something and so just being honest with ourselves and with whatever we're finding is like creating 
communally beneficial systems of reciprocity. And if people can just make that one switch altogether, multiple different areas of their lives are going to probably end up seeing a lot more benefit, or at least that's been my experience. So, Absolutely. Right there with you. I mean, and that's, that is the funny thing too, about something like, you know, everyone's saying the future is fungi, the future is fungi. And I, and I giggle at that because I'm like, well, <laughs> the past, present, future is that, and so much more. And to me, the joke there is there are mycorrhizal fungi, right, that live in relationship with the terrain that are helping do resource distribution and make the forest is all happy and has the things they need. But there's also saprophytic fungi, right, that break down, that are decomposers. And something like the lumber industry would be like, they're parasitic. How dare they? <laughs> How dare those turkey tails break down the this log that I want to sell, you know, and, <laughs> and so that's the thing when I say the future is fungi. I'm like, yeah, fungi can help us. Fungi can hurt us. Fungi can do everything in between. And it's not an anthropocentric like thing, you know, um, <laughs> and, and, and that, and that aspect to me is actually like the beautiful poem of all these things that people want to make taglines about. I'm like, take it further because there's always going to be sort of the left hand and the right hand spiral of whatever y'all are talking about. I mean, and that's why over the last, God, where are we in time? Like over the last four years, I've been more out in talking about poison plants and poison mushrooms because I've really wanted to spark this conversation of where did we get this notion that certain things are poisonous and certain things aren't? What, what does support our health? What doesn't? And is that a black and white? Is that contextual? Is that defined by inner authority? Is that defined by outer authority? Like there's just so many funny things when we see how people will latch on to the next thing and say, yeah, the future is fungi. And I'm like, great, like black mold can F you up, you know? So yeah, the future is fungi maybe, you know? <laughs> um, so it, it, I get a kick out of all of that, um, honestly. <laughs> oh, you know, I do too. Well, and especially about like various strains of aspergillus um, mm -hmm. of, you know, the bl black mold, the black mold, because lots of molds are actually black, but the black mold um, about so many of these other different fungi and yeasts that are oftentimes demonized within the context of medical, um, well, just medicine in general. You know, I find that there is a correlation that they grow and proliferate exclusively in terrains that are already toxic and need a form of decomposition. So like if something is wet and it's a synthetic material, that synthetic material is not natural to the habitat. And so nature comes in with its greatest agents of decomposition to help that thing. I've also noted that in areas where there's the most concentration of stray electricity and electromagnetic pollution, you get the largest concentration of black mold. Ha -ha. So there's a lot of things where like we we don't even yet understand how EMFs are and like intense radio frequencies are altering natural signals and how these molds are actually from a natural perspective agents to try and recalibrate. Now they don't have the same timeline as a human life. They don't have yep. the same timeline even as an animal life or, or a plant life or any of these things, a tree. So for them, their timeline is totally different and unique and subjective to their species and whatever the job is. Just like you could say like our colonization of say the United States or other things, it's undergone multiple different iterations, multiple different species have inhabited it. And you have to look at it over a vast timeline to say, how did that impact the ecology? Their timelines are almost that exact same way. They're very telescopic and that they just have a method of colonization that helps to um, rebalance the ecosystem as seen subjectively from their own species and their own state of incarnation. So that's it. The cleanup crew. I, I'm the cleanup crew. And, you know, I have a, I have a friend, Darren, shout out Darren Springer. And he says, 
fungi were the original colonizers. If you think about the theory of panspermia and this idea that then like Terence, you know, spores traveling through the ionosphere and, and literally this rocky ass planet so that we had soil, you know? So even these notions of colonization are really, uh, you know, twist and interesting to think about in when we look at these large scale these large scale conversations conversations that are happening between species um and so we're just constantly in flux basically is the is the deal <laughs> yeah huh. constant dance and um sometimes a ting from a different perspective which is why part of why i love sounds is you know, and that's divination, right? It's it's sometimes you don't need to add something in. You don't need to extract something out. Sometimes you just need to look at something differently and perceive something in a fresh way. And I have compounds for that because sometimes the medicine is in that neutral space of just like, ah, oh, let me recalibrate to the bigger story that's being told. What are we, what is the cleanup crew known as whatever the latest, <laughs> you know, health concern is on the news. Like, what is that? What is that cleanup crew? Um, why would it be happening? What is the, you know, uh, impact of DM stuff with all these different things, right? So. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about flying ointments, if you don't mind, because that's, that's always been something that uh, has really fascinated me as a student of multiple different um, disciplines of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about flying ointments, oftentimes people will know those as witches ointments. And the common thing that they probably read in some, you know, hipster article somewhere was that uh, w women would create, and it was pretty much exclusive to women in these articles that I've read, that they would put uh, some sort of ointment that was usually like a tallow based infusion um, of various psychedelic plants like henbane or datura um, and then insert it into the vagina on a broom handle and this is where they came out with the whole concept of flying on a broom and blah 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 and now that's overly generalized because <laughs> flying ointments have actually been used by men and women for millennia and um, when we take a look at it in tiny little isolated pockets of small villages with priests who are anti-women witches, this is where we get the majority of that literature, right? Of, and that, that perspective of flying on brooms. And especially in Scotland, this was outrageously popular to accuse women of. Mm. So with that being said, though, um, you know, let's talk about some of your experience with flying ointments and some of their values beyond just quote unquote flying, mm -hmm. because we're, it's really kind of providing a buoyancy to the spirit as far as I can tell. And in mm -hmm. my experience with it. So I would love to hear your experience and, and kind of your own take. Oh gosh. So many, many things again could be said, I'd say first and foremost, I mean, I, when I started studying ethnobotany um, in an academic context it's the early thousands you know and my sense at that time was the only way that people will take me seriously when I want to talk about plants and fungi is purely through an academic very heady very cerebral lens and when I learned that tale of the witches broomstick and all these things you know I was in my early 20s and I thought oh my gosh <laughs> this is the me the the tripping the, the the psychedelics of my ancestors you know I must try so I started not with solanaceae potentially fatal plants I started with like damiana and cannabis and what it began to teach me first and foremost was what would it look like to learn about plants from plants with plants through my body, through not only my body, but through delight and through pleasure. And as opposed to this sort of like, <laughs> style, you know, what would it look like to 
awaken the ancestral memory in my bones, in my cells, all these things through joy, through fun, through play, through touch, you know, um, which again, to me, at least for me, is so much of this women's wisdom that was effectively demonized by something like the Roman Catholic Church, you know. Um, so first and foremost, that's always what I say about flying ointments is they reoriented my way of learning so that I could learn through my body um, and through pleasure. And even, you know, when I was studying botany in um, college, right, when I asked, why do plants and fungi make all these cool alkaloids, these drugs, plant drugs? And uh, the answer was always, oh, they're anti-herbivory compounds. They're just trying to resist pests. And I'm like, what about attraction? What about connection? You know, what about all of these things based on like a pleasure principle? Um, so I feel like flying ointments taught me how to sort of not poo-poo any one discipline but how to harmonize all of these different disciplines and that's how my mind works anyways is how to harmonize um academia and that style of heady research with the lived experience gnosis the literal body of knowledge um do ancestor work all these different things right but yeah i think there's also like some really exciting conspiracies as far as looking at something like um, the nightshade plants, the Solanaceae plant family, which includes Datura, Henbane, Belladonna, all these things, um, Mandrake, um, and even Mugwort um, is an interesting one we could talk about. So some of these European flying ointments that were written about by these priests, um, so like the early, the early priests that were told to take of the so-called pagans, um, styles of the unguentum, different preparations of these balms. And them was a green balm. And it was maybe thought that the green balm came from Artemisia, from mugwort. And if you look at the name, the Latin, a lot of people know mugwort because they smoke it. On, right? But if you look at the Latin name, Amicia, the question becomes who's Artemis right right <laughs> and then the question becomes okay Artemis also known as Diana so it's like <laughs> who's Diana <laughs> and and why was she she was said to be like the all the all encompassing like leader of the European witches right they were all all these so-called European witches were praising Diana and she was like um, you know, um, the succubus type yeah, <laughs> archetype, right? even, um, you know, yeah. Right? And, and what does that mean when we talk about Artemis or Diana, the goddess of the hunt or the goddess of the wild who wields a bow and arrow? It's like, what does it mean for a woman who knows how to aim towards her vision? And why would that be demonized literally? Um, but then even too breaking down the importance of, Artemisia plants, so wormwood, sweet annie, all these things, um, not just in dreaming and in so-called flight and visioning, but in uterine health and midwifery. So now we have this conversation of were these so-called witches actually women who knew how to work with the womb? Mm, yeah. Which is the port, which is darkness which is the portal of life and death. And that power requires great responsibility. And there's just so many things that come oh, from yeah. that. Yeah, like, so, well, that, that opens up so, so, so many things, actually, because, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about midwives, midwives herbs, witches herbs, and this is true very much so in the, the British, um, and especially in the Irish tradition, Brist or Bridget is seen, you know, simultaneously as a pre-Christian goddess type figure of the Tua de Danan, uh, in one hand, the, the daughter of the Dokta, and able to um, heal, she knows 
all the arts that there are about healing. She knows also about how to use plants and other things for war purposes. She has, you know, the breach of the generous heart is another one of her epithets. There's all these different types of, of things. But then as we view Hecate, as we view Diana, as we view all of these other pan-European goddess traditions, we find that they are associated with witchcraft in, in that same vein of yeah. being able to bring life in or being able to hold life out, being able, you know, using contraceptives, herbs for contraceptives, using herbs for abortifacient reasons. Um, so really being able to hold the power of life and death so much within their, their own hands and within their own grasp. I think it's really fascinating. And as you know, as you were talking about mugwort too, one thing that I wanted to mention was that, you know, that was the authentic brewing herb for all ferments and ales before the advent of, of uh, hops, you know, before the introduction of hops. That's why it was called mugwort. It goes inside of the mugwort. Isn't just another old English name, Saxon name for herb or plant. And the mug, you know, and so oftentimes you would add this in there as a fermentation agent because it collects a great deal of wild yeast on it. So, I, you know, it's it's really fascinating to me. Bingo. I mean, bingo, which again, so many things you said we could tangent off of too, like Bridget and how when she was a baby, as far as I know from the stories, she was only allowed to drink milk from the white cow with red ears. So there's a lot of folks who talk about a possible Amanita Muscaria connection with Brigid and, you know, even the fire in the head story and all of these things. Um, but yeah, also this idea of brewing and alchemy and, and even on a practical level, something like mugwort being in a fermented ale um, also to sort of like to, to help support uh, 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 it's so-called, right, so-called antiviral, antifungal, all these things. And so not having weird stuff grow in your fermentation. Yeah, exactly. S stuff that's going to kill you, basically. <laughs> stuff that's going to kill you. And I always thought it was so interesting when in the beginning of the COVIDian times, I think it was, I'm trying to remember which African country where they started doing the clinical trials with wormwood or sweet and i think it was anua artemisia anua mm. and i thought isn't it interesting that mugwort and its relative plants are not to me i associate them more so with where i grew up which is in southern california the chumash people worked with mugwort and still maybe do work with mugwort um to rid of like ghosts and ghouls in people's dreams it's like to scare away, to scare away the unsavory entities. And I thought, ah, isn't it interesting that we're talking about an herb that works for this issue that's really about scaring away um, entities that are not the most kind. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, let's really, let's really talk about entities now. And again, like, why would that be such a ugu booga, like scary witching herb? There's there's a there's a thread that runs through all of this to me, which is totally. like, what entities are we scaring away, and what are we really talking about through this long ass timeline, five hundred years of some weirdness plus, you know? Oh, easily, easily. Well, you know, the, it's interesting that that uh, did you say the Chumash mm -hmm. were used it for that because. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of evidence that I think I read about this first in the book called Witchcraft Medicine. There is a decent amount of evidence where it was planted along the roadsides all over Europe in Roman times and even pre-Roman times to be able to scare away harmful spirits from travelers who would be traveling on the road. So, you know, how fascinating um, and again, the, the relationship with um, scary viruses, <laughs> whether they're really scary or not, uh, being able to eliminate those. Do you have any idea? This is just a, a thought in my head. I, I hate to put you on the spot. But do you have any idea of some of the phytochemistry behind um, 
Artemisia species and like lowest common denominators of different phytochemicals that they might have that tend to be like, quote unquote, antiviral, antibacterial. I think Thujone is worth talking about. That's true. And I know that primarily through my absinthe making days. Uh, yeah, it's like making, you know, that was the whole whole initial reason from a chemical perspective that they told me like, oh, yeah, you have to have wormwood inside of your absinthe because Thujone is so molecularly similar. I remember looking at diagrams molecularly similar to THC that it has this very otherworldly type process. Now, for me, I don't at that time, I definitely bought into ideas like that. At, at this point in my progression, I don't look at molecular constituents or active constituents being responsible for any particular effect. But I do remember the striking similarities between the molecular um, construction of Thujon and THC and thinking, oh, that's very interesting. And even people who are coming off of cannabis or want something to smoke during the day, mugwort tends to be a really good alternative because it doesn't toss you overboard like you know <laughs> thc sometimes can especially delta 9 but it gives you that cool kind of just chilled back vibe that you can definitely rely on so yeah i'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about thujon well you know what intrigues me and this is where like the 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 physiology part of my thinking meets the poetic part of my thinking is whenever I think about these sort of like hardcore aromatic compounds that come into our body, at one point they come in almost as irritants, right? They irritate the vagus nerve bundle and they irritate the liver to a certain extent. And through that so-called irritation, they're creating movement. So when I think about the liver in baseline consciousness, the liver is about filtering out the blood, right? Filtering out the blood, this closed loop, more or less system um, to filter out excess hormones, extra, excess neuromodulators, all of these things. So really we're talking about letting go of certain things that we're supposed to let go of and keeping what we're supposed to keep. And we're talking also about digestion because we know that the liver is inherently connected to how we do or don't digest food but I think we're also talking about activating the liver is also about digesting feelings, literally because of processing out neuromodulators, but digesting ideas, digesting concepts. Um, so I do feel like some of the sort of strange and wonderful so-called, you know, psychoactive effects of anything that has thujone in it, in a poetic sense, comes from that act of digestion and how we choose to digest certain ideas and metabolize things. Mm. Um, there's something to unpack there. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Especially, you know, as you were talking and talking about the liver is like, oh yeah, like it can actually suppress or increase certain enzymes. And that affects the way that the bile is going to impact like things inside of the digestive tract, which then alters digestion in general. And if, you know, if you take that thread of like, a thing is not just the thing that you see, it's a multidimensional information packet. Yep. So, you know, yep. the carrots that you eat, the tomatoes, or whatever, you know, the meat, the, the lack thereof, whatever it is, mm -hmm. those have multidimensional codices that we are breaking apart. And we can look at it just on the physiological level of like, oh, here are the proteins and here's how the DNA actually breaks apart enzymatically into these different proteins and how these get converted into this and how these minerals do this and get very physiological with it. But behind all of those, there is a spiritual encoding. There is an emotional encoding. There is a, a, you know, a mental and causal encoding inside of all of these things. And altering the way that your body is going to absorb or break down those things and by what speeds also creates a certain filter of consciousness. Now, all of this is just kind of in, in this term is really just kind of dawning on me now and inspired from what you were sharing. So that's a, that's a very interesting concept, Ash. It's fun, huh? <laughs> Yeah, too fun. <laughs> That's going to keep me going on this, this train of thought here for a little while and actually seeing, 
you know, how, how I would be able to analyze that or quantify that for the purpose of my research, mm. you know, you don't have to quantify these things in order to have the experience. So I'm not trying to get overly analytical, but in showing and in teaching, we have to be able to have models to draw upon. And that's, you know, a huge part of my work. And, and obviously the way that my brain enjoys engaging in reality. <laughs> totally. totally. I mean, and that's the thing is like the, the message is the message is the message. And different people gravitate towards different mediums. I know in certain rooms, I will only talk about physiological action. In other rooms, I go on some weird ass thing talking about the etymology of all of these words and talking about gnomes and, and you know what I mean? And, and in spaces like this, I can be free to be like, and it's all the same, it's all the same message, you know? So so yeah, yep. sometimes, you know, I'm sure too, like with your clients, it's like certain clients want to see those numbers. They want to see those readouts. Others, others, they want to hear about how it feels in the body, you know? <laughs> and yep. That's, that's the thing to each, they, they've got their own way of assessing and relating to the information. So. Yep. And I feel like for those of us that have that finesse to be able to like code switch, if you will, um, we can reach so many different hearts and minds with interesting trains of thought. And that's why I make the freaking candy, you know, like I make herbal candies and that isn't because I love being a candy maker. It's because it's a way for me to tell a story to people and to spark their curiosity about plants and fungi. And they're doing it through the lens of deliciousness. <laughs> Which is so fun. I, I, you know, you are doing through epigastric um, kind of candy making the same thing that I was doing through beverage chefing with Niyama was like, it's a way of being able to relate herbal intelligence in a way that is sociologically acceptable and fun. And you're able to draw in a demographic that otherwise would have no interest in your story or that plant's story or intelligence and being able to deliver it in a way that suddenly becomes meaningful and relevant to their own way of life. And yep. yeah, I, I really, really, really admire that. I remember at the Good Medicine Confluence, you were like, hey, I have, I think they were like blue lotus truffles. Do you want to try like a lotus truffle? Yeah. And it's like, oh yeah, I do. And then you had like some caramel sauce and which is amazing, by the way. Oh my God. Just from the ingredients that you listed on the bottle to the texture and flavor, I was like, this was divinely inspired. <laughs> like, wow. Um, I've played a lot with those ingredients. I've done a lot of raw fooding. I've done a lot of different types of chefing types of things. The texture and the flavor profile that you have as the base recipe for your caramel sauce is so next level, Ash. I just have to say, like, from <laughs> one one uh, epicurious uh, yeah. type of fellow to another, like, oh, my God, it is so good. It is so good. Yeah. That's that to me. That's that like grandma style thing where again, like it's so easy for me to indulge in the heady realms because I do enjoy that to a certain extent. But then there's that, I always remember from my grandma Genia, so that's my mom's mom. Like she never taught me recipes by giving me a list on paper. It was like, okay, when it feels right, when the texture looks right, when the color is kind of like this and I'm just really engaging the senses. So is interesting because many, many, many years ago when my grandma passed away, it was right around the same time I got a job as a cook. This was a long time ago. So that was another one of those downloads I got where it was medicine, which is also kind of a weird word in itself, but right. medicine doesn't have to be disgusting. And I kind of came from that program too, where it was like, I need my medicine to slap me in the face, you know, and make me <laughs> barf in the bucket or all of these things. Right. And right. there's a time for that. There's a time to get our asses kicked, but there's also a time for it to be nourishing. And that to me is that grandma feminine mm. intelligence. There's a time for our medicine to be nourishing, to hold us in a space of greatness, to remind us of our inherent um, 
harmoniousness and even how I practice as an herbalist is, you know, so many people are obsessed with these antiviral, antifungal, anti, anti, anti compounds. I'm like, well, there may be a time for that, but there's also an importance in these tonic tonics, right? Which is the food, like the, the nourishment, the feeding, the scaffolding of our being, the feeding, the, the tissues of our being, um, you know, creating an environment and a context of beauty so that shit doesn't have to go wrong in the first place. And if it does, we're more robust anyhow, you know, so so food is is like a nice way to tell a story about all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Speaking of which, I just want to say that I think it was maybe December's candy of the month that you had sent out that was like, pomegranate walnut lime yeah caramels like oh my god that was amazing noriana tried it she's like wow fee she she looked at me because you know i'm kind of very uppity about food combinations these days and cool. she tells me i don't know if you're gonna want to have this because of food combination i looked at it and i said oh no all of these things go well together just as long as i don't eat this like within half an hour of say like meat or cheese or you know something like that mm -hmm. um all of this goes really well together and so i popped the first one in my mouth and i oh my god the the nuttiness and the lime and then the pomegranate coming through and like it was like a symphony in my mouth i'm not even kidding you ash like you definitely have a, one hell of a gift for being able to take herbal intelligence, food intelligence, and being able to make it so fun and so delightful. It's like writing the most brilliant story imaginable, but through food and instead of reading through organoleptics of scent and taste. And I just, I have such a deep appreciation for your work on that level uh, and on so many other levels, but that level last month in particular hit me so well and your caramel sauce i have to say um the so i i think i've had two forms of it now i had one that i think was a turkey tail varietal and then yeah. and maybe maybe it was just medicinal mushrooms in general mm -hmm. i can't remember but then the second one was pine pollen one and yeah. man yeah both of those super, <laughs> super awesome. And uh, they went so well. Instead of creating icing, Nori and I made like a einkorn uh, sugar cookies, but with much less sugar than what you would normally put in. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of frosting or icing, we would just add a little bit of that caramel sauce and spread it nice and thin over it. And wow, what a beautiful, beautiful offering. It was so good. Thanks. I mean, and that's the thing is sometimes more often than not, the recipe ideas come to me through, not through a culinary frame of, of envisioning, but that, that caramel, the uh, pomegranate molasses caramel was inspired by the forbidden fruits class I taught. And I thought, okay, how do I tell a story through food about pomegranate, about this this fruit that is both sort of this beacon of fertility, but also it's like, oh no, it's the forbidden fruit and it's associated with Inanna. Like she's so scary because of, like we were talking about earlier, like she's she's both goddess of fertility and war and oh no, a dynamic woman, what are we gonna do? So I was like, great, I wanna make a caramel highlighting this potency and story of pomegranate but then I was like, well, I also want to talk about the idea of red and red enchanted fruits and red enchanted foods. And I found these amazing red walnuts. And of course, walnut too is a whole other conversation of why walnut is so cool. But yeah, so sometimes it's like, like, again, the message is the message. And I'm like, how can I translate that through the medium of food? And Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I can say that too. I know I've like not satisfied everyone. Sometimes people are like, this is really weird, Ash. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I'm just, I'm trying here to tell a poem to, and not everyone likes all the poems that we all make. <laughs> and so like, I've definitely, I remember once I made, tried to make more 
like s'more pop tarts with and I tried to make like jujube marshmallows and oh wow it, it wasn't as good as I saw it in my mind you know <laughs> you know though there's sometimes things take a couple of different iterations there they definitely can take a couple of different iterations although um golly what is the name of it uh there is oh meadow foam meadow foam honey if you ever get the opportunity to get a single variety meadow foam honey huh. and you want to make something marshmallow in texture or flavor I can't recommend any like quote unquote natural ingredient better than that. It literally tastes like a vanilla infused marshmallow. It is delicious. Mm. I used to make a lot of mead in Portland with that particular varietal. We we had about three varietals that were really common. Meadow foam, we would get every fall, every mm. every autumn. The beekeepers would always say, hey, I've got like 10 gallons of meadow foam honey. It's like, I want them all. Yeah. <laughs> and then they, you know, we always had wildflower and then especially blackberry varietal um, mm -hmm. up there in the Northwest. And so those were the three types of mead that I would regularly make. And I used to make what was called alchemied, which was where I would make uh, various different extracts of various herbs and plants. And then for, do a secondary fermentation on the mead with those extracts in there because they add starches and they add sugars, right? And so I remember with the meadow foam honey, I did one with uh, vanilla, Madagascar vanilla bean and uh, raw cacao powder and heshu wu. Ooh. And it was like a chocolate, chocolatey, vanilla chocolatey alchemy. And my students went over the moon for that one because you know back in those days uh we would have three hour long alchemy classes every wednesday students would come over and uh they would usually the the lessons usually turned into like five hour total lessons that you were there because they'd come early drink some mead have a lesson and then stay afterwards and we'd have a little break in between they'd have more mead and then more mead afterwards and it just <laughs> <laughs> and I think they came for the mead more than the alchemy. But anyway, that's where the term alchemy came from was all of the students were like there under the pretense that they were learning alchemy and getting sozzled and losing all their cabbages. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's the joke. I was just talking to one of my mentors yesterday. We were catching up. We haven't talked in a while. And I was like, yeah, you know, I had a, I have, I have a few private mentees. And I was like, yeah, I had a student recently and I did the soup making class for her. And 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 sometimes I question, I'm like, are they going to get like, why would I do a soup making class? Everybody knows how to make soup. I'm like, but when we can recognize the the sacred or the spirit in such a mundane act as cooking, as soup making, as mead making, these are actually some of the most alchemical cauldronish brews we could ever talk about. And it's one of those hidden in plain sight things where when we can play with the technology that is required to make an amazing mead, to make an amazing soup. This is the same technology that we can apply to all of these cool, heady, far out things too. But but to sort of separate things out, like, oh, it has to be really advanced and look really strange for it to be magic. I'm like, you know, I live in a magical terrain and that's what makes everything medicine you know what i mean so so drinking yes. meat, drinking mead is i mean first of all god bless honey i mean we can just oh, talk yeah. about honey this whole time too like talk about like a distillation of the land through the body of the bee i mean oh my god i know yeah that yeah i remember learning from benjamin pixie a lot about the magic of the bees and how important they are. And of course, this was in the context of the eco-sex convergence when those were happening. And so it was this very highly erotic eco-sexual type of awareness of how the bees are constantly making love to all of the flowering plants and being able to pollinate and spread the semen of all of these plants for the fertility of all of our crops and basically the whole damn world as we know it with the, with very, very few exceptions. 
So yeah, yeah, I know. I am so entranced, so entranced by bees and bee magic and and honey and all the things. But yeah, to go back about what you were saying about uh, being in the kitchen and and the magic, I think you know Nori's form of witchery is less so at the a square altar with deities. And it's much so at the altar of the stove and the oven and being able to utilize the right herbs and the right type of ingredients and flavors that make the soul sing when you light it up that act as, you know, not just soul food in the way that we know it as like deep, deep fried, you know, fatty, greasy, salty, whatever, but something that literally activates the different centers inside of the body that are health promoting either on the physiological or psychological or spiritual levels of our being or whatever. So yeah, I think, you know, it's, it should not be discounted the concept of kitchen witchery. It is a real important aspect. And the more that we can utilize just the love and the intention with any of the ingredients we have available it was really amazing. Anyway, those pomegranate uh, car caramels that uh, you made, they were really, really interesting and fantastic to me for a number of reasons. And they got me talking about the Philosopher's Stone right before I went on an interview with this guy named Juan. He has a podcast called The Juan on Juan. I had just eaten one of your, your caramels because it was going to be a while to dinner, but not a long enough for me to say let me eat a whole meal before this interview so I had one of your caramels and I was so inspired by the pomegranate and every time I think of the pomegranate it takes me back to the tree of pomegranates which was a book uh, on pseudo spiritual a 19th century occult revival alchemy by Israel Rigardi but more specifically he didn't know this at the time of writing it but in the flamel pathway of the dry works of alchemy and the creation of the philosopher's stone, the red stone through the flamel pathways. At the very last phase before your entire material inside of your flask turns red, there's this weird looking crystalline tree that forms. And then it eventually forms these red little fruits that have always been elucidated as pomegranates. Ah. And so they ultimately will fall off of that tree. And after a long period of incubation, those fruits actually turn the entire material red over time. And mm -hmm. uh, that is one of the final stages in the creation of the Philosopher's Stone through the Flamel method in the dry way. And I was not planning on talking at all about the Philosopher's Stone, but this guy asked me, you know, so the Philosopher's Stone, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, oh, well, I'm getting into this. And I remembered that all of that was just directly related to that pomegranate flavor that you had inside of those caramels. And it turned into like one of the most eye-opening interviews uh, of any interview that I've been on. And I was just speaking very, very openly about very deep alchemical secrets, um, mm -hmm. largely inspired by that. So Thank you for, for your magic and all of your, your wisdom and all of the inspiration that went into those caramels. Cause yeah, they still stand out to memory. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm excited to listen to that interview now. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that, that there's so many connections even there with this idea of, a, I guess, a old Babylonian texts, um, arguably the first ever resurrection myth that we know of, at least in the Western world. Um, and it's the story of the Hulubu tree, which we think was a pomegranate tree, and Inanna, and how that tree is connected as a fruit of the underworld, and the Persephone story came from the Inanna story. And so now connecting that to this notion of a philosopher's stone, um, even just in symbology, is very exciting. And I'm going to sit with that for a long time. Yeah, the, as you mentioned, the concept of the underworld, I find it really interesting because it's literally taking these above ground fruits that have to fall to the earth and then sink into the substrate and then like change the entire nature of the material, color, scent, everything is changed by those. So like, is it in the underworld? Yeah, for sure. Like it goes into that other world and changes the whole nature of the ground. So huh. fascinating, really, really fascinating. Ooh. 
Well, Hash, we've been at it for about an hour and a half. I would love to keep going, but I do have uh, another appointment coming up before long. I would love to continue our conversations, though, another time if you are open to it. Like, I just feel like we could wrap and go on and on and on about lots of things. Yep, we could. I mean, that's the thing, kindred spirits. I have to shout out my friend Thor, who sent me, I think it was the podcast you were on, um, higher so when you were on higher side chats some some time ago. And he was like, this guy is your, is going to be your friend. And I was like, this guy is going to be my friend. So, <laughs> well, yeah. and it was so wild, like how <laughs> just immediately, like I saw you walk through those doors at Good Medicine. I was like, yo, what's up? And <laughs> I even remember like Owen coming up to me and being like, do you know her? I was like, not at all. But I <laughs> really, really like her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. It's true. Yeah, we're kindred kindred spirits for sure. And I am so happy to chat it up with you and Nori anytime, anytime. So, <laughs> so before we go, Ash, please go ahead and tell our listeners where they would be able to learn more about your work, how they can find you and any things that you may have coming up or want to let people know about. Thank you. Well, um, you can find me on the interwebs at Black Sage Botanicals. So there's a, a Instagram page. I'm more active on that than on ye old Facebook. Black Sage Botanicals, blacksagebotanicals.org is my website. Uh, let's see what else. I also have a whole digital class archive. So all of the things I have taught are available to... Oh, look at this. <laughs> All of the things I have taught are available to you. Um, there is a digital class cloud. I have some, a few interesting elixirs on my page. And I'm actually about to announce a part three to my ongoing Am Amanita muscaria coursework. Um, so I'll be announcing that class probably in the next couple days. And it will be happening in February. But yeah, Black Sage Botanicals. I'm out there. Find me. I'm sometimes even out there in the world too, in 3D. <laughs> I'm such a hermit, you know, but uh, I pop out every now and again. <laughs> now, now, I haven't checked the official schedule. Are you going to Good Medicine Confluence 2024? I'm like 98% sure. Okay. And yeah. are you are you there as an attendee this year or are you there as a speaker? I'm going to speak if I go. Uh, yeah good oh, you yeah. need to you need to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna speak if I go for sure <laughs> super super cool and what for for listeners again what's your handle on Instagram black sage botanicals is my handle on on IG I also have a patreon page so I do live stream Q and A's every month so people can ask me whatever the heck they want and I'm down to have the weirdest conversations you you desire uh, for the most part on there. Um, so yeah. yeah. Cool. Gosh, <laughs> so awesome. You know, I love, I love this, this modern age and I love the systems of like Patreon and things because it gives a platform to creatives like yourself to be able to do what it is that you're doing and to be able to be funded, you know? And uh, I, I think that it is so critically important to, just every era to have something like that. And we are so blessed in this era to actually have like official platforms that will help, help us raise money for ourselves for things that people would value that they otherwise would not have access to. So it's really rad. It is. I was resistant to the whole digital everything for so long until I recognized that if I approach it in just this is the this is the spirit of connection manifesting it through itself through the technology we've chosen in this day and age. Like everyone, you know, in 2012 was like, we're gonna be communicating instantaneously. And instead of doing that psychically, we decided to do it through phones and stuff. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great, you know, great. I can look at it in a non-dual way. And yeah, I'm really thankful for all of it and all the connection and kindred kindredness that we can have through these these mediums. <laughs> I know you and I both, you and I both. It really is an awesome blessing, and have folks on the other end that are like, "Yeah, I can hang." Yeah, <laughs> that, right? Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's the cool part. Yeah. You know? 
Ash, I really want to thank you so much for all of your time today. Like this conversation, just like every conversation that I've had with you is just so fun and my cup gets filled up so personally. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And to all of you listening, if you liked this podcast, please go ahead and hit that like subscribe button, uh, share it with your friends because uh, we're still a relatively small podcast, but we're sharing really big ideas. And uh, it may not be mainstream yet, but if we can keep sharing these ideas and getting fun information out to people, fun, relevant, cool, interesting information out to people, it will continue to grow. And eventually that will turn into the alchemic culture or culture of alchemists that we are looking to create through this podcast. So I just want to thank you so much for listening. And again, be sure to share this. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, go ahead and post your uh, comments down below in the YouTube page. And you can always feel free to write us at supportphoenixaurelius.org. If uh, you are listening through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of the other places that podcasts are found and syndicated. So to all of you, thank you very much. And again, to you, Ash, until next time, my dear friend, looking forward to chatting again. Sounds good. Thank you, my friend. <laughs>